Hi, my name is Lorna Little and I am the president and CEO of St. Anne's Family Services. And I'd like to welcome you to our virtual annual summit as we explore the timely topic of the changing face of homelessness. Whether you're one of our dedicated supporters who've joined us year after year at our wonderful summit luncheons, or you're joining us for the first time today, please know that we are delighted to welcome you to this conversation. We look forward to connecting with you safely in person someday soon. And at that time, we'll be able to talk and greet each other in our normal fashion. Until then, we are going to have a wonderful conversation today. I wanna give a special thank you to our sponsors who help make today possible. The Charles Dunn Company, Terry Holloman, and Occidental Entertainment Group Holdings. This discussion today is meant to be informative and to share some insight about how we are addressing homelessness in the greater community. My hope is that you will walk away with some greater understanding about how you can be a part of the solution. The changing face of homelessness is meant to get you thinking about who is homeless in our community, individuals, children, and families. And to start, I want to start with, you know, it's important how we um, speak and talk and name situations and individuals. You know, we're going to refer to people as in individuals as unhoused and unsheltered or experiencing homelessness. And this context is important to bring the humanity back to our neighbors who are experiencing this. This is not who they are. This is not a permanent condition. When we change verbiage and language, it's a start to changing our approach. And sometimes it may seem simple and elementary, but as you know, and we all know and understand, it takes baby steps to make big change. Our guests this afternoon are an esteemed group of panelists who lead organizations that are in the front lines of addressing homelessness here in our city. Each of them has unique perspectives, just like I do from where I sit as the president and CEO of St. Anne's Family Services. I am thrilled they could join us for this conversation as we've been doing work in this area of providing supportive housing for families for many years. Our first guest, and these people are dynamic, and like I said, leaders in this area, is Heidi Marston. She is the Executive Director of the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, also known as LASA. Heidi Marston was selected as the Executive Director of the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority in June 2020, after serving as the Interim Director for a while. She is entrusted to serve as the leader in an effort to reduce homelessness across the greater Los Angeles area. She also sat on the Leadership Alliance for the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Heidi joined LASA in February 2019 after being the pro chief program officer at serving at the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs in several roles, including Director of Community Engagement and Reintegration Services and Special Assistant to the VA Secretary under President Obama. Welcome, Heidi. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Our next panelist and guest is Miguel Santana, the president and CEO of the Weingart Foundation. Miguel Santana has more than 30 years of experience leading numerous fiscal, legislative, political, and community issues. He served as the president and CEO of Fairplex since 2016, a nonprofit community benefit regional organization based in Pomona, California. He also previously was the city administrative officer for the city of Los Angeles, where he oversaw the city's nine billion dollar budget and designed the city's first comprehensive homelessness strategy resulting in 1.2 billion dollars voter approved housing bond and a doubling of the city's general fund investment on programs to end homelessness prior to joining the city miguel served as one of five deputy chief executive officers for the los angeles county overseeing all social service programs supporting children families veterans, and persons experiencing homelessness. Miguel joined the Weingart Foundation earlier this year. Welcome, we are happy to have you. Thank you, Miguel. 
So we also have another uh, panelist and special guest, Pastor Troy Vaughn, who is the president and CEO of the Los Angeles Mission. Troy Vaughn has dedicated many years of experience advocating for prison reform, homelessness, and poverty dynamics in Los Angeles. In addition to his role as the president and CEO of the Los Angeles Mission, Vaughn serves as the executive director and founder of the Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership, a network of public, community, and faith-based agencies and advocates working together to help people who have been incarcerated build new lives for themselves and their families. He also serves as president and CEO of Christ-Centered Ministries, which he also founded, and as the senior pastor of Restoration Family Worship Center. Last August, he was appointed to the board of the Prison Industry Authority by Governor Gavin Newsom. Welcome, Troy, you've been busy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you for having me. You're welcome. So thank you all for being here this afternoon. I mean, having these thought leaders together to have this conversation is exciting. I'd like to start off by, you know, getting right into this. We have a lot of people watching and we want to make sure we have an opportunity at the end of this conversation to maybe hear from them. Um, so I'll start out with Miguel, you know, um, Los Angeles County is home to more than 66,000 people. 66,000 people who are unhoused and shelter, unsheltered. What are the most devastating social and economic factors that you believe contribute to this epidemic? We can't hear you, Miguel, for some reason. Okay, we got you. We can't hear you. No, we still can't hear you. But that you know what, this is what we do. We 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 heard you before, and all of a sudden we can't hear you now. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna give Miguel an opportunity. We're gonna troubleshoot. And so Miguel, you have some amazing answers to this question. I know that are dying to come out, and we're gonna hear them in a second. So what we're gonna do is see if we can go to a set an, another question and come back to you, um, because I don't want to shortchange your amazing answer. Um, so Heidi, can you, we test your audio to make sure we can hear you? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So what I'm going to do is we're going to troubleshoot Miguel's audio and we're going to, I'm going to ask you a question, Heidi. Um, you know, you know, when St. Anne's Family Services built our, you know, permanent supportive housing complex, Beverly Terrace, you know, first we had our transitional housing. And we said, wow, we want to make sure there are opportunities to provide housing along the continuum. And so we built Beverly Terrace. And it was really meant to be a bridge to our transitional housing, um, you know, from our transitional housing program and then eventually permanent supportive housing and then flow into the community. Um, since opening that in 2018, we haven't seen much of a flow because there aren't as many um affordable housing options in Los Angeles for our families to then move into. Consider the exceptional cost of living in Los Angeles, and I don't think people realize until they come here how incredibly expensive it is to live here. How do we create a city where, you know, affordable housing isn't you know, a luxury or a thought that, you know, people just can't even attain? So what are your thoughts on that, Heidi? Yeah, it's such a great question. Uh, I think the important thing to remember at the most basic level is the current housing market, whether it's here in LA where we see these issues or across the country, it's operating exactly as it was designed to operate. So in order to make these changes, we really need to look at the policies that are in place that drove us to the point that we're at today. And fundamentally, LA's homelessness crisis is rooted in this long history that we have of segregation, of red lighting, of blocking off communities to certain communities of color or low income individuals where we are denying access to credit. Um, and all of those issues compound further and further when we have government at every level, whether it's, it's local, it's state, it's federal, really hitting this trifecta of policies that create a housing crisis um, by really stunting housing growth um, and not investing in new housing coming online. We also see increased housing prices. 
and, and fundamentally, we've seen the cost of living and what it costs to, to actually have an apartment here far outpace our minimum wage. So what that looks like is in LA alone, you have to make $42 an hour just to afford a two bedroom apartment, which is like two and a half times the minimum wage. So, so we're really yeah. creating this system that's excluding people who have these, these essential jobs. And on top of that, we're doing it in the context of a county that needs 500,000 units of affordable housing just to meet our current demand today. So, so we need 500,000 units of affordable housing. We need to make at least $42 an hour to afford an apartment. And we're fighting to get people to a $15 minimum wage, correct? That's right. So there are some serious systems issues. And, and thank you for sharing that information. Um, I'm going to go back to Miguel after, but I, I'm going to you know, continue to move forward. Um, Pastor Troy, um, you know, yes. the supportive housing programs we provide at St. Anne's Family Services um, is designed for current and you know former foster youth. We have housing for individuals to, to ensure that they are able to survive and thrive. And so do former foster youth and incarcerated individuals factor into the housing equation? Because when people have a vision and we talk about the changing face of homelessness, um, there's a perception of who is homeless. There are young people who are aging out of the system who are dealing with being homeless. How would you successfully re-enter, um, successfully look at re-entering formerly carcer incarcerated individuals and also former foster youth into um, the system that allows them to have appropriate housing? Yeah, thank you for the question, Lorna. And I want to say um, um, to Miguel and Heidi, good seeing you guys. and. Thank you for all of your good work that you're doing. I, I mean, it's really a good question. I think when you think about homelessness, in order to really solve it, you got to really think about the systems that create the influx into the system, right? Like um, a lot of times we like to focus on the issue, but we're not really attacking it from what's contributing to the issue. And when we don't address other systems, then we create, we exacerbate the system, which is what Heidi was just referring to. We can't build our way out of this situation. So we have to change existing policies. And we also got to think outside the box. So for foster care, for example, one of the things that we're working on here at Los Angeles Mission is working with um, some of our partners who do foster care work like Guardians of Love. And really coming up where as individuals who are high functioning, timing out of foster care systems and looking at seniors, which so we have two populations, right? Like that two populations that could end up into homelessness if they're not addressed. But what if we matched high functioning foster care youth that are timing out, ready to go to college with seniors that can stay in their homes if they had a companion? What if we create a unique um, opportunity for those two populations what we do is we basically create a relationship that can prevent two groups of people from entering into homelessness and make sure that seniors can keep their homes. They can also get um, a companion that can also be a mentor to the young person and the young person can have a house. That's one way of thinking outside the box. The other thing, when you talk about incarcerated, formerly incarcerated individuals, returning citizens, as like I like to call them, because when they're returning back to our communities they're actually citizens right like we want to make sure that they have rights that need to be restored to them and we need to think of them that way you talked about the language right like and so returning citizens need to have opportunity and a lot of cases they could return back to their families be because of the collateral consequences that are a part of the carceral system itself, right? Preventing them to go back to families if the family was on Section 8, for example, they're not allowed to do that. So where we can fix the system, we should immediately fix that system, right? And then we should also look for um, opportunities of shared housing models, right? Like I think shared housing is a solution, right? For us to really begin to address homelessness, especially in a community and in a municipality that has outpriced the homeless market, right? Like, you know, like 
when people are, are unhoused or the housing market where people are unhoused and they can't afford to house, one of the things we can do is we can create opportunities for people to share in housing, right? Like we can share in the rent, we can share in that, create roommates, share housing structures. So that's one way of doing it, especially with um, those that are returning citizens because they oftentimes can um, benefit from the process of stepping down from living in a communal situation to living in a roommate situation before they can actually move into their own unit. Thank you. And I have to say that one of the things that I think um, makes uh, Troy unique is that he comes to the table with lived experience, having experienced homelessness and having kind of gone through the journey. So when he speaks as a professional, he also speaks as someone who is really um, knows what works and what doesn't work. So thank you for sharing that. Thank um, you. Heidi, um, you know, I really like to inform myself not only for as a professional in this space, but just talking to people in the community. Um, I live downtown and, and I see a lot of things that, you know, uh, people experience and share and have conversation about. And one of the things is this not in my backyard concept. And when people think about that, someone said to me earlier this morning, they said, well, I want to support and help with initiatives to help individuals unhoused but I don't necessarily want to have someone in a tent in front of my house. This is a real conversation this morning. So I want to say, just to clarify for people, because we have all kinds of people listening who have a misunderstanding about what supporting, um, you know, multi-unit spaces or, you know, creating affordable housing. We know that affordable housing and homeless services do not decrease property values in that way. And people say, well, if they put that in my neighborhood, it's going to decrease the property value. Or if we support this initiative, this is what's gonna happen. And then the other question and connected with that is, if we built that and provided those supports, would we see a decrease in areas where people felt that they need to have to live in tents as an option? Yeah, thank you. I the, the, the NIMBY, the not in my backyard is certainly something we hear of a lot. Um, first off, in terms of property values, there have been a number of studies that have looked at this over the years, and there's just no conclusive evidence that suggests that it impacts property values either way. Um, so I think that's, that's one piece to just note from the data side. But at the end of the day, homelessness is here. It's already happening, whether we build housing or we don't build housing. Um, you have people outside in tents. Um, having large encampments has impacts on businesses. It has impacts on daily life, not only for those who are suffering outside, but for people in those communities. And so really the question, it should not be, does it decrease property values or what kind of what's in it for me, but it's how do we create and really think about long-term um, building out of stable and bringing stability to our communities in a housing market that um, can support people at all income levels, uh, where people have options of places to go in the communities that they're from. Most people in LA are experiencing homelessness where they grew up, uh, where they've been for the last 10 years, where their people are, right? So the community is really important. But um, to the extent that we don't have the housing available, we will always have people suffering outside. So the question really is, how do we change that as quickly as possible to create those permanent options that really resolve homelessness? Because at the end of the day, these folks are worried about uh, how am I going to go to the grocery store without my tent being stolen? Where am I going to go to the bathroom? Um, these are fundamental basic human needs um, that we have to address quickly and housing is the only permanent way to, to really end this and make a difference. That's so important. You know, people are worried about basic needs, trying to, you know, um, make sure that they can buy food and basic necessities. So Miguel has rejoined us, the, the wonders of technology. Um, and I'm gonna go back to the question that I, I started to ask him, let me check, do, do a mic check with you, Miguel. Great seeing you again. Oh, wonderful, that voice. You almost could be a singer, okay? you know, <laughs> great voice. So, um, you know, what I started to ask, and, 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 and there are pieces that we covered, but some of it still, we wanna hear your, your perspective on this. We talked about this. Los Angeles is home to more than 66,000 people who are unhoused and unsheltered. 
Um, what are the most devastating social and economic factors that you believe contribute to this epi epidemic? Well, homelessness is the manifestation of all of our broken systems. Our systems, particularly those that are here to serve our most vulnerable uh, people, children and in foster care, uh, individuals experiencing addiction or mental health uh, challenges, uh, folks who are housing insecure. There is no coordinated system within all of the layers of government who is responsible for ensuring that there's a safety net to assist those individuals who are experiencing homelessness into ongoing housing mm -hmm. and as important to prevent them from entering systems, the, uh, entering homelessness. What exists are a number of very effective or um, you know, solid interventions both in the public sector and the private sector, and certainly in the nonprofit sector as St. Anne's is so capable of doing and has done for many, many years, but there's not one coordinated system. The second issue is that um, we've, we've managed to create a way to make it almost impossible to build affordable housing without significant subsidy. And uh, the system of building affordable housing today is designed to not be built at scale. It is expensive. It is uh, heavily reliant on taxpayers and it, it confronts challenges from a land use perspective that doesn't tip the scale for building housing, but rather thinks of individual interests often ahead of the global interest. And so it's a combination of a, a no systemic approach and the challenges in making the building affordable housing affordable to build, when you combine both of those systemic failures, you're seeing the, the growth in people experiencing homelessness uh, throughout the region. And unfortunately, it's gonna take a dismantling of those broken systems and a recreation of something that has an end game in mind. And that is ensuring that no one in, in Los Angeles is experiencing homelessness. And if they happen to be in, in that situation that it's very short, that it is uh, immediately, um, uh, there's a system in place to immediately provide them the housing and as important, the services necessary so that they could stay in housing. Unfortunately, we're a long way from creating that despite the unprecedented investment that has been made to respond to this crisis. And that is what, you know, it's so important when you, you talk about the system, you talk about potentially dismantling the system in order for us to move ahead. And people, you know, working within the system, everyone trying to do their best, but there's no coordinated effort. And there are aspects of it that are working to make that happen. But we really have a challenge ahead and we really need to work as a community together um, because someone who may be watching this who doesn't quite understand how all of this works, but they know there's been significant investment, that is where some of this confusion lies. So thank you for sharing and, and providing some clarity um, around what needs to happen. So one of the things you talked about, and, and we actually started the conversation around is, and I'll ask um, Miguel and Troy and Heidi, of course, as well, but you know, LA's homeless population um, is about 34% black. Uh, considering this demographic represents around eight, you know, sometimes it says 9% of the total population. How does justice, diversity and equity and inclusion factor into this glaring disparity? Because, um, you know, we wouldn't want people to come away with the wrong impression of why that is, but we need to have some conversation as to how the impact of racism impacts the homeless population being at 34% for black individuals? Well, we live in a, in a racist system and, and this country was founded on it. And our, all of our institutions were created around racist systems. And so it is not surprising that, um, that there are disproportionate people in the African-American community who are experiencing homelessness because in many ways, those systems were designed for that outcome. 
And um, as, as Heidi had mentioned, just looking at land use policy alone, uh, Los Angeles uh, was designed to be segregated. It was designed to prevent people based on who they are to live in certain parts of the community. Um, those communities were denied resources. Those communities were disconnected from employment. Those communities weren't uh, allowed to generate wealth by by, through home ownership, which is the way most people do. And so over time, that legacy takes on a actual form and, and homelessness is one of the most clear representation of that legacy of racism in, in this country. But, you know, very frankly, in Southern California, which, you know, which was developed over the turn of the last century, was very much designed to be that way. And so as we think about dismantling systems, those very systems alone that were created um, uh, and grounded on segregation and inequity have to also be dismantled and recreated where equity, diversity, and inclusion are at, are at the center of them. And so resources have to be shifted to, to respond to those historic inequities that we have today. That is... Uh sad a sad truth oh they can't hear me so, so troy wanted to jump in uh, yeah i wanted to i wanted to add to that thank you miguel for grounding us in that truth i mean really when you talk about the economics earlier there was a question about the you know economics that contribute to homelessness these systems are economically sustained right like they're, they're sustained for a reason right and the reason why it's so hard to break them down is because people are fighting for their own survival, right? That uh, perpetuating those systems, right? Like, and so they don't wanna give up that economic engine. But one of the things that we have to start doing is even as we start thinking about development in terms of housing, we can't just do it in an isolated way. It breaks my heart when we put large projects in the middle of nowhere and they're housing, right? And for supportive services, but there's no community infrastructure around it. How you talked about the right and the desire for people to go to grocery shopping and to have a cleaners and, you know, like just to live in community. And so the unhoused that we're creating housing from, we should do it. You know, we're getting ready to put large amounts of units here in what the people call the Skiro area, but the infrastructure to support those people that are moving into those units doesn't exist. And I think that we know the model, right? Like people build housing in rural areas and community, but they just don't build housing. They build full infrastructure around that housing. Why? Because you need that infrastructure to to create the sustainability of the model, right? And so every system that we have is designed, as Miguel already stated, to keep us in the state of poverty, um, to keep us in the state of, you know, um, dependence on the government. And right now, the pandemic has even exasperated that. We have more and more people now unwilling to work. Not there's just no jobs. We have people that are actually now, we have the greatest resignation in our country that we've ever, from the system itself of employment. And the reason why is because we're subsidizing that system now. And we're allowing people the pathway of least resistance and they will choose that every time. I, I can tell you right now as a successful black man, right, as a successful black man that um, has worked his way to where I am right now, I still am impacted by the system of racism. When I drive my car in the streets, if I'm pulled over, I, I feel a sense of fear. I had to buy my home and I had to put more money down than a normal, my neighbor, next door neighbor did in order for me to move in the community I live in. That's the reality we still face today, right? Like it's because it's the system that's designed to keep certain people groups down because that's what this country was founded on. Until we face that reality, all of us, from the top all the way across, we'll never begin to solve this because people need to admit that they're fighting to keep in place um, a system that provides for food on their family's table. And that's what people don't want to do. They don't want to let it go. That's why the carceral system is such you know, a mainstay in our society is because it replaced slavery, right? It replaced an economic engine to have affordable, um, um, low paying wages. That's why I do, the, I'm fighting for the work that I do on, on PIA right now. But people that are in the carceral system to actually get paid a, a livable wage while they're actually doing slave wage jobs while they're in there and create a pipeline of employment for when they come out. So as I'm listening, um you know, once again, you know, listen to these very hard conversations, but real conversations that need to be held. 
you know, there are systems issues. Things are working the way in which they're designed to. We have to dismantle the system, yet all of us are working to make an impact and make a difference while within the system. Um, I wish we could wave a wand and all of a sudden it's, you know, we don't have to deal with that anymore, these issues, but that's not where we are. So how do we continue to find hope um, and, and, and know that we're making differences a small bits at a time? You know, um, I am going to go into, you know, some of the questions that I want to ask, but I, I have to be mindful that as people are watching this, they could walk away and say, uh, you know, is there going to be any difference made? But we have to start with the truth. We have to start with the foundation. And we have to be aware that when we build housing, as you say, it has to be community, connected with the community. No one wants to be, you know, isolated out and not have those connection points. So we're going to have to have a whole nother conversation where we get to some <laughs> deep aspects of this as well. Because, um, but I, but connected with that, you talked about the pandemic. And, and I'm going to direct this to, um, Miguel and Heidi, since it was brought up. So, you know, at St. Anne's Family Services, we've seen the pandemic's economic impact on all of our families throughout the community. Um, those seeking, you know, necessities, people needing, you know, help with bills or rent or, you know, just to use their stable housing. How has this global pandemic increased the number of unhoused people? And did what I really want to know is, some of the short-term um, aspects that were put into place to help families and children during this time um, not lose housing or find unhoused people housing, how did some of that transition into long-term policies, if they did, to help um, find families you know, safe places to live? Because I'm going to tell you, I remember once the pandemic started, you know, there were, I looked out on the streets and a lot of the people who were out there weren't there. So I want to know, we were able to make those system shifts so quickly during that time. Did any of those quick actions lead to longer term policies that will help families um, in the long run? So I can take a first stab uh, at that. Of course, COVID um, has so many lasting impacts. I think, um, of course, when COVID hit, there was this immediate question of when you are on house and we're all being told to shelter in place and shelter at home, how do you do that when you're living in a tent? And so yes. really the first effort became how can we move people indoors yes. in a way that's safe, um, they have their own room where they can self-isolate. And when we think about the, the long-term impact that that has, we had an initiative called Project Room Key here in California where FEMA provided funding, the state provided funding, and we got hotels and motels to operate um, as shelters. And I think the biggest thing for me that's a silver lining of COVID, if there is a silver lining, um, in addition to the, the deaths that we prevented and the spread that we prevented, it was far, the impact on our population was way less than it could have been. Um, but we saw with Project Room Key that when we all align, and by we all, I mean the systems of the federal government, the state government, our local policymakers and electeds and all of our funding, when we all align and say we're in the boat and that's where we're headed together, we can move so much faster than we ever thought that we could. We got thousands of people indoors. And so I really wanna take that energy, take those lessons and catalyze those to keep it moving because it just breaks through the barriers. Um, and then just one piece I did wanna mention that you had raised is about the impact on the population. I think there's no question that the visibility of homelessness in LA increased through COVID-19. A lot of it is because we didn't do a lot of the management of trash pickup and encampment management because the CDC guidance um, was that. So we saw encampments grow. Um, that said, we do not know that there was an impact in the homelessness number, the total number of people yet. Um, we'll do our homeless count in January and get a sense of what it looks like today. But I think it's really important for people to remember when we talk about policies that were and decisions that were made decades ago and how we're feeling the cost of it, we have a really critical moment right now in this eviction um, and all of these people who are facing eviction through COVID, when those protections lift, we're not going to see the impact of people who lose their homes overnight. We're going to see it three, four, five, six years down the road from now because there's a lot that has to go wrong before you end up on the street. And so 
it is so important that we make the right policy choices today so that in the future we're better equipped to manage the crisis and change the trajectory. If I could add, I think there's a couple other things that we learned from through the pandemic. Um, one of them is, you know, it was a universal pandemic. It didn't matter where you lived, how much money you made, uh, how many children you had. You know, everyone was vulnerable to the pandemic and people from all sectors of our community experienced it. But it very clearly demonstrated uh, the gaps and the gaping uh, uh, holes that we have in our sy systems by how the pandemic impacted certain communities more than others. There was, there was no denying the fact that your zip code was one of the strongest determinants of whether or not you were going to be exposed to COVID-19 and whether you were going to die from it. And, and uh, your race and ethnicity was added to that. So African-Americans and Latinos disproportionately in, were impacted by, by this disease, were more likely to, be, uh, to die from it. Their children were more likely not to be connected to a, an education system because they didn't have access to Wi-Fi. They were more likely to experience food insecurity and housing insecurity. And what was interesting to see is that folks who were living middle-class lives prior to COVID suddenly were in a position of crisis and had to, for the first time, stand in a food line to get food, had to find ways to, to make ends meet so they could pay rent. So they, hopefully what that created was a sense of awareness that, um, that how fragile our system is and how vulnerable we all can be uh, when a crisis occurs. And with that, Hopefully what will come out of that is greater empathy and, and, and support for those who are the most vulnerable to the point where we have the political will to make the systemic change that is necessary. Um, and so that gives me some hope that there's, 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 it's impossible now to argue, well, those systems are working great. They're, they're exact, you know, we want to just go back to the way things were. I think there's, there's a consensus by most folks here that, you know, COVID really exposed how broken our systems are. And we should use this crisis as a catalyst to reinvent and create something better that works for all of us. And I think that's so important that we learn from these challenges and we learn how, you know, because we talk about all these systems and barriers, but we, in this crisis, we jumped into action and, and there were things and changes, positive changes made. And we don't wanna go back to the old ways of doing things just because policies and practices were done that way. I'm gonna ask Troy, um, thank you, Miguel. Troy, um, are private shelters and community-based housing programs designed kinda to help with the influx of individuals and families? Who are the individuals that should be in some of these kind of short-term shelters and why? You know, one of the things that we're finding, I think that Heidi and Mikhail's response to the pandemic was spot on. And, you know, when you talk about the idea of hope, I think that missions and shelters like the Los Angeles Mission can play a very vital role in helping people move into permanent housing. And I think they're uniquely suited to be stabilizers within the system, right? We're not designed to be long-term care housing. We all agree that people, who are, are unhoused or experiencing homelessness have, you know, a, deserve a right to be housed permanently, right? Like that's an agreement that we have. But we also gotta be practical about steps that people need to do to, in order to get there sometime, right? Like, because when people are returning home from incarceration, for example, having a place where they can stabilize immediately if there's nowhere for them to go to is an important step in that process, right? While we kind of work on things and other barriers that that have been impacted to really solve those issues. So one thing we've done here at the Los Angeles Missions is shift our focus during the pandemic. We stayed open the entire time in terms of how we do services. And we became a mission without walls because we began to see is that we have this unique ability after 85 years of existence to connect and be a bridge builder, right? Because those that are mostly impacted um, oftentimes have their own solutions for their community, but they're furthest from power and resources. And so we see ourselves here at the mission is that connecting to bring those power and resources to communities that need it. 
So I think that's one of the roles that we play right now is being a bridge builder and helping donors and volunteers understand that there is capacity here and there is actually hope. I'm living proof that there's hope that can come out of Skid Row. Something good can come out of Skid Row. Um, and so I used to be in a cardboard box. Um, you know my story, Lona, and, I, and I'm right here on 7th and Crocker. Um, and I went into a mission and now I'm leading a mission. So when you talk about hope, I'm the possibility of what that looks like. Um, and so that's why shelters and missions are important because they give a peop they give individuals coming um, home or newly experiencing the situation. They prevent them from actually going to the streets. And actually that step is a very important step that we should not omit from the process of talking about how do we solve the homeless crisis. We don't have, we don't have enough that deal with family units though. And I think that we need to make more temporary spaces that stabilize families and move them rapidly back into housing um, to help them secure the things to keep them in the housing because we don't want to keep perpetuating situations right one of the things that i was challenged with with the during the pandemic and i loved project room key and i think that it was a great project one of the things that did discourage me i must admit however is that a lot of the resources and service providers that are our permanent supportive housing providers sro housing corporations that have been providing services for a long time in our community were omitted from the conversation of being a part of of how to create that kind of housing. And so we failed in, a, in, a, in an opportunity, I believe, to create and to, to build up an infrastructure that existed and that we could have been sustained out of that. And so what we did was we left um, use units, right? And we went to hotels that eventually would have to return back to their own use, right? I think that that was one of the things that I would wish that we would have done differently out of that particular opportunity. But I think that you know, just in terms of answering your question, um, we play a vital role. Um, individuals and families can be stabilized in shelters in a very temporary capacity and moved. We see that happening all the time here at the Los Angeles Mission. And we have great placement numbers in the permanent supportive housing opportunities as they come on board. Thank you. So um, our last question, as we get ready to prepare to take questions, from um, the people who are uh, viewing our conversation is, and you know, you've answered some of this already, but you know, the key strategies as regular citizens, because we all work in this field, we're working in this environment, we're trying to do everything possible, you know, from a, a policy standpoint, working with legislators, working with, you know, community organizations, working together with all these systems that we're trying to improve in terms of talking with each other. But regular citizens who are saying, look, I don't know what to do. Um, you know, people who don't understand the impact of kind of significant chronic mental health. Um, there's a lot of questions that people have around that, you know, are there places, um, uh, housing and facilities if someone was ready to and interested in accessing? There's so many things that still need to be explored, but what do you think a regular citizen can do to help with the issues in terms of decreasing the number of Angelinos who are unhoused and sheltered? What can someone do? Is it voting? Is it um, learning more? Is it you know going to a community agency? You know because people show up when there's a problem, but what is it that they can do now? What do they need to be aware of to be able to help work on this issue to be supportive of our community? I, I would say there's really three three things. And, and the first one is starts with sort of the way you started the conversation. And that is to acknowledge, acknowledge the humanity of, of those people experiencing homelessness. And, you know, it's impossible to drive anywhere in Los Angeles or in your day to day activity to the grocery store, dropping off your kids to school where you don't see someone who's who's suffering, who's experiencing homelessness. And it is our tendency to avoid eye contact, to avoid acknowledging that person. You know, it is um, it is something I worry about a lot that we're teaching our children to accept the this this reality and and it's okay to dehumanize someone who's literally in front of you yes. and so i think it's important that just as a human being is to acknowledge that presence 
by simply giving them eye contact, by saying hello, by acknowledging their existence and validating their own humanity. So that doesn't cost anything. It is it is it is something that is um, that we're losing as Angelinos as homelessness becomes normalized. But it's something so essential to move beyond. The, the second thing is, and, and it was talked about earlier, is that we only hear the voices who are against building housing. We only hear from those folks who take the time to go to City Hall to express their opposition to uh, the solutions. When most Angelinos do believe that there has to be a universal approach. And so, and that homeless, the housing for those experiencing homelessness needs to be throughout the region. So take the time to make those opinions heard, that you are prepared to have uh, housing for people who are among the most vulnerable, affordable housing in your own neighborhood and welcome them when they get there and, and, and fight to have that housing built against those interests who are afraid, who are bigoted, who have um, ill-conceived notions of what it means for them, their families, their safety, and their property values. Angelinos need to speak up and, and fight against that kind of uh, bigotry against our most vulnerable population. Thank you. I would echo everything Miguel said. It's about saying yes. It's about using your time, your resources, and your ability to learn more, to ask questions, to understand the complexity. Because I think, if you, as you've heard throughout this whole conversation, we all fundamentally believe that being unhoused in LA or in America isn't a character flaw, and it's not an individual shortcoming of something somebody did. It's a policy and a system failure that's fatal. So uh, as a result of systems that need to change, we've developed this response to homelessness that is really built on charity and is built on nonprofits shouldering a lot of the responsibility. And those nonprofits, while they do have funding, rely heavily on volunteers, rely heavily on donations and heavily on the communities to support them. So use your resources to support those agencies on the front lines doing the work, while we also work to dismantle and undesign these systems that have gotten us here. They have to happen simultaneously. And yes. that is, you know, flying the plane while we're, you know, restructuring. So mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Yeah. And we have so a couple, and I, I'm going to let you jump in, uh, Troy, but I wanted to add the, the, a question that has come in actually in a minute that's going to actually give an opportunity for all of you to speak. But did you want to say something before I go to? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, they all talked about civic engagement and just, again, volunteering. And when you come to places like the Los Angeles Mission um, and volunteer, right? Like be a part of the solution. You got to be a part of the solution that you see. And I'll, I'll close on this in terms of that, because Heidi and Miguel did a great job of saying a lot of things that I wanted to say anyway. But remember the lessons that we learn when when we're touched with whether it's a pandemic or an epidemic like the AIDS crisis. And we started seeing that our own family members were being impacted. And it wasn't one specific group of population that was being impacted, but mothers and children and people. We saw that it could attack all of us. We started to galvanize our resources to actually around that thing to solve that issue. Same thing when we see other crises happen, whether it was, you know, um, now we see here in this particular pandemic against COVID because we have empathy when we're touched with it, right? When it's isolated and it's outside and we say it's them and not us, then that's when we can separate ourselves and those us become, you know, them becomes the invisible group, right? The marginalized group. We have to fight to keep the empathy that we've learned during the pandemic, that we all can be touched in a very particular way and it impacts us all. So when someone is unhoused, it impacts you, whether you know it impacts you or not, it actually diminishes you as a human being. And that's why they deserve to be seen as a human being because we're diminished and the, the, the divinity that's inside of us as diminished and you can get involved raise your voice be a part of the solution that's critical there's so many opportunities to do that and so for your listeners i think it's important for them to hear that and be reinforced and reinforced but you have to get involved you actually don't have a right to complain if you're just doing it from your couch okay yes um so there there are a couple of things that 
um, I, I want to ask that have come up in the chat, because I think one of the things that I see happening is kind of there's this broad brush approach of um, looking at individuals who are unhoused and their needs. And so a question that has come in from Nancy is, and this is something that I wanted to touch on in this conversation. So thank you, Nancy, for asking the question is, how do we handle the mentally ill who are not getting the medical help they so often need and then leave the housing they are provided? Because there's, there's, there's a lack of housing uh, support for individuals, especially with chronic um, um, mental health issues and in need of supports. They're co-occurring disorders. We can get into substance abuse and all of that, substance use. But how do we work to provide housing, but those supports that are necessary for individuals who um, have significant, um, and these are her you know, language, mental health issues? Well, we have we have things like street medicine. I was just speaking with the founder of street medicine yesterday on my podcast that we need to pay attention to, like, and we need to educate people on why that's important. They go into the highways, into the byways, they go into the encampments, and they provide comprehensive health care to individuals in their living situation. Talking about meeting somebody where they're at. The issue is, is that all those people, although those people are eligible to be billed for underneath our medical system, our medical system, they're not able to bill for that because it's not in a fixed brick and mortar structure. And so what happens is those dollars that are tied to triple H and so and 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 other resources are sent to augment those services from those that um, the medical teams that are actually going to people to providing those medical services and while they're unhoused. And so we need to fight to make sure that that becomes a billable thing because the individuals that they're serving are actually eligible to be get those services. Then we're able to redirect those resources to housing, which, you know what I mean, to create more housing resources and opportunities. So we can do both things, but our system always fights against each other as if it was some kind of cancer or something. And it just always, it's always fighting against systems and we're not thinking outside of the box, but we actually do have teams that go to people to provide healthcare every day, supportive services every day to people that are living in encampments. We do it while we're working to get them housed. I think um, th th that was important. I, you know, we you mentioned the number of people experiencing homelessness in LA County, over 66,000 people. But the solution is really a one person at a time. Yes. Every person who uh, finds himself in that in that situation, got there for their own unique set of reasons. And so our system isn't designed to meet people where they're at. Our, our system is designed where you have to go on an assembly line where different uh, interventions basically do their, do their part, but they're not connected to each other. So, so sometimes they're in conflict with each other. Sometimes um, they contradict each other altogether. And so, and so, um, by creating housing with no condition, creating housing that meets people where they're at, where the most important thing is to be housed. And then once they're housed, providing them uh, the support to keep them housed, knowing that it's not a linear line. You know, if you know anyone who suffers from mental illness or who suffers from addiction, you know, recovery comes through a series of failures. It doesn't just happen one day. It's almost impossible. That is that is part of the process. And so some some folks may come inside for, for one day, then be outside for five, and then come back for three days, and then be outside for two. And then eventually uh, the goal is to keep them housed for the long term. But if you design a system that is really uh, places the individual at the center, not not government systems, not other rules that you're expecting that person to go through, then we're going to be much more successful in ensuring that people stay in housing, regardless of what what are the circumstances that led them there. Yeah. And so you got you raised some important points because, um, you know, someone who uh, recently become unhoused because, you know, they got laid off and, you know, missed that first rent payment. Someone who um, has chronically uh, worked through some of these issues, as you said, it's a journey, 
um, and has been unhoused for years. And you don't have the same approach for both those individuals as meeting them where they're at. And that leads to a question that just came in. Um, how do you house people who are not interested in the supportive aspects of supportive housing? Yeah, so part of the model that we really hold up is what we call housing first. And there's a lot of um, misperceptions about what that means. But fundamentally, what that upholds is this idea that we need to put people in the driver's seat of their own future. Uh, so tell us what you need. And to Miguel's point, it's our job to create the systems that are accommodating you, not forcing you to conform to what we think you need to go through. So if that means for you that you just need a place that you can afford to pay the rent, that's great. And we need to, to meet those services. If you need supportive housing that has more case management and more support kind of reintegrating, we have that too. But um, designing programs that are flexible and can meet the wide range because every person's case is different and unique. Um, and that's fundamentally how we're going to change this as opposed to a one size fits all approach. And, and I think the, the communication and sharing about the different approaches and different needs is going to be an ongoing process because I think that's where sometimes the community gets stuck. They broad brush and, and see us. This situation is one that's very difficult to solve in that way. We have another question from uh, Gordon who asked, how do we educate the community against victim blaming of the unhoused? I believe not enough knowledge is provided for the community in regards to the many aspects unhoused persons become unhoused it's similar to what we were talking about but you know there is a lot of blaming you know in terms of there's fear and i think you know fear um when people feel fearful they kind of turn that fear outward and, and and start a lot of negative conversations and, and blaming individuals because there's a variety of scenarios so how do we go against how do we go about keeping people from blaming individuals who are unhoused and making them the reason why these problems are are in our society i mean summits like this i mean off conversation i mean i mean when people start to see people as human beings that's how you start breaking down that misconception right like i think it's very important um to do that right like just to beat people where they at give people more information we do that through various mechanisms our, our larp network is one of the ways we do that through all of our working and issue committees where we give people opportunities those that serve in nonprofit organizations those that are just individuals to come one of the our, our main um commissions to do out of there is to educate the community um so we do a lot of convenings to help people to understand the you know returning citizens that are coming back into our community and why they're not to blame in a lot of cases that systems have created um, perpetual cycles of, um, you know, incarceration within our communities, helping them to now re-enter back into society is a part of that. But I think um, churches, temples, synagogues, working to educate themselves where people return back to, um, to really create that space where families are being, you know, restored. I think that's a, a unique opportunity, in my opinion, to um, use to help educate community around um, it, it, who's in their communities, right? Like I think that knowing who's in our communities and being able to see those people through various events and gatherings such as this, we're in a Zoom capacity right now, but um, hopefully when we get back to in-person meetings, if we ever do really get back to in-person meetings, it'll create more and more opportunities for people to be educated. So I think that's an opportunity. I, I also think that it's important to, to put the facts on the table um, and show how it's in all of our best interests to get people housed. You know, when back when I was at the county, I oversaw a project called Project 50, which identified the 50 most chronic, most vulnerable people experiencing homelessness in Skid Row and tested this idea that they're not service adverse, that they actually there is a way when you lead with compassion and persistence that you you can in fact move people into housing. And we were successful in doing that. But the other thing we did is that we tracked those individuals and went backwards. We actually tracked how many times they had been inside the emergency room, how many times they've been in and out of our jail system, how many times uh, the police had been called on them. 
and and it actually accounted for the cost to taxpayers to keep people unhoused. And that cost was significantly greater than the investment that was made to make to provide housing for that individual using a housing first approach. Uh -huh. So unfortunately, there are some people who are are never going to have the empathy or be sympathetic, yeah. but they do have the self interest. And as taxpayers should be concerned that it actually costs us more to have a broken system where you have 66,000 people experiencing homelessness than actually having good. one coordinated system that gets people housed for the long term. It's in our collective self-interest and in our pocketbook's interest to ensure that we end homelessness. And and that's an excellent point because, you know, first of all, as you explained, everyone's not going to get on board. But if you can't do it from the simplest perspective of humanity and, and caring about your neighbor, there is a self-interest. And I think that means um, we need to do a even better job of communicating that data and the facts. And I love the facts that you were able to follow and, and, and get that um, information. But um, persistence and compassion works in all fields. We have to approach people from a compassionate pace and place and really care about them. It's one of the things that my team knows that I always talk about here at St. Anne's Family Services reaching out to people and leading from a compassionate place, but also caring about the people that you're working with and serving. You don't do anyone any uh, good if you don't really and truly care about them. So thank you for sharing that. We have a question from Sean Charles who says, can someone speak to the safety in shelters? We often hear they can be dangerous and a determinant for a determinant rather for utilizing the service. Not everyone is mentally ill and can we also talk about the working unhoused? So there are two parts of the question, the safety in shelters, which deter people from maybe using them. And then not everyone that's unhoused is mentally ill. Can we, Ill, can we talk about the working unhoused? Yeah, we, I could, I mean, I run a shelter. <laughs> so, so I can tell you right now that our shelter is completely safe. Um, we, you know, you know, we have surveillance, we provide safety, you know, we have um, safety officers that are present everywhere. We have great working relationship with law enforcement. But more importantly, we create community. Like, you know, really when you, you know, um, meet people where they're at, no matter where that is, and you treat people with the, the dignity that they deserve, that's returned in kind. I mean, we are probably one of the safest places that you can be, you know, in 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 a place like Skid Row, like is inside the Los Angeles Mission, is because um, it's a it's a protected place, it's a sanctity, um, it's a place where you can find services. Listen, if you're if you are driving a car and they teach you in DMV, if your car hits a skid, that you're not supposed to turn away from the skid, you're supposed to turn into the skid in order for you to find your solutions. And so oftentimes people's lives may hit a skid when they come to Skid Row and often say, turn into the LA mission because we can offer solutions for you. We can offer you safety. We can offer you um, temporary um, housing in a safe and clean environment. We can give you meals. We can give you supportive services. We can link you to affordable housing options that suit your needs and are tailored to you. Um, and I think that that's the key, right? Like helping people to see that, but we all got to have that. We all got to change the narrative and we, gotta, we all have to make a place like Scare Road not to become a place that's skipped over, but to actually be seen as a community where people can actually get resources and begin to attach itself to a new opportunity for living a life anew. Thank you. And, you know, many films and documentaries and photo essays have been done around Skid Row. Um, and it is often portrayed as a community, but one where, um, at times there isn't enough help going in. So hearings about some of these additional programs and supports for providing um, them opportunities and options is very helpful. So thank you for that. Now, the last part of the question, which is um, the working unhoused, you know, not everyone um, th this individual is saying is mentally ill. Can we talk about that? Because if you talk about going back to Heidi, you know, $42 an hour to be able to afford um, a space to live. And then if you have 
you know, family and children and all the different things that you need to do and take care yeah. of, how it, it, the system, as we started with this conversation, it's very difficult for us to be able to um, move the needle. Uh-huh. So we have to talk about starting with, you know, providing adequate wages and, and adequate um, resources. And as with the pandemic, everything is going up, the cost of everything. So talk a little bit about um, what you think we can do. It's connected, obviously, to housing, but there are other foundational layers that need to be addressed. And you, you mentioned that before. Yeah, absolutely. And I think bringing in the mentally ill piece, too, you know, it's something we hear about a lot. We know that there are people who are unhoused who experience mental illness. At the same time, one in five Americans experience some sort of mental illness. And so working and mentally be, having mental illness are not mutually exclusive. Um, there are a lot of people who have severe mental illness um, who are housed and unhoused. So I think that's one piece of it. But I'm really glad that you raised the, the, the part about families, because when we talk about people who are unhoused, we tend to think of the people that we see right, which are the people who are getting our attention because maybe they are having a traumatic, they're going through a mental health crisis, maybe they, there's something happening. Um, but what we don't see are the thousands and thousands of families and individuals who are in motels, who are living in their car, um, who don't present to be homeless um, because they work full time. Um, the mothers of multiple children who can't afford childcare but need to go to work. Um, the teachers who are sleeping in their car. So. I think it is this comprehensive piece of so many people, um, they want to work, they can work. Um, and at the same time, if you're unhoused and you want to work, that's great. But that means you need to figure out like, where can you get a shower regularly? And how do you get to your job if you don't have a vehicle or public transportation? So we just like we need to create access to housing, we need to create much easier access to income, um, not only income support, you know, through entitlements, but also through income earning um, that helps get people on their feet because being housed is step one. Staying in that housing and thriving is like really where the work starts for a lot of people. And so we have to be able to give those opportunities to them so that they can then they can grow and they can all become like Troy, <laughs> you know, well, and I, big organizations and be successful. But we I, have to help support that. I, I would add that there, you know, we really, as Heidi pointed out, we do have a housing shortage. And so it's the basic of supply and demand. And with the with the shortage of supply, the prices are going to be reach levels where where many Angelinos can af- can afford. So the solution to that is to build housing. And the current model of building affordable housing re- relies heavily on government subsidies to the point where you can never build it at the scale to meet the demand. And so what needs to happen is there needs to be predictability in yet land use policies so the development can occur without the barriers that exist that are self-imposed by government and that that tip the scale to individual interests versus the interest of actually building housing. And so there's going to be people who are not going to like that. That means the nature of the way Southern California is going to have to change. But then we have to ask ourselves, where are our own children going to live? I mean, this is a place where even, you know, middle class families are having a hard time finding places to live for their own children as they become adults. And that and it and it not only impacts the quality of life here, but it impacts our economy if we're not able to uh, provide for the next generation. And so allowing, creating a, an approach that uh, makes the building of affordable housing affordable to build by ensuring predictability, by providing uh, a pathway for the construction of housing, that's going to ultimately help reduce, reduce the cost or at least contain the cost for housing so that working families aren't living in their cars or staying with the relative um, while they're working. And creating the social enterprises that can help sustain those systems, right? Like one of the things we do through um, another one of my organizations that I oversee is we have a lot of social enterprises that we've developed. And those social enterprises are designed to, one, provide employment, but actually recapture the dollar that's being provided to the organization. So like if we have to provide laundry services to the people that are living in our 
facilities or our residential um, settings, then if we can own our own laundry service business instead of send that out to someone else to take that dollar and keep it in the house, we're able to, to now leverage that dollar that we get to sustain that and create an employment opportunity. We did that with several. We created a laundry service business. We created a food service business. One of the things that we had to do, talking about a system that divides itself, we got audited by the Department of Public Health while we were running Department of Health Services programs. And they said that we can't have kitchens, we can't serve food inside the houses anymore. So we actually had to create a social enterprise that would provide food offsite in a commercial setting to actually now provide that. It actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise because we were able to employ people that were graduating from the from our facilities and our agencies and also provide the service to our other community-based organizations. And so that nonprofit or that, that microsocial enterprise has grown now to three locations, but that happened in the midst of a pandemic and it happened out of a necessity that the Department of Public Health said that we couldn't cook in the houses because they were in commercial settings. And we actually either had to, and we had to actually go out and actually order food so we couldn't afford it because our line item budget didn't allow us to do that. So we created our own enterprise to do it. Um, and it was just a blessing of the Lord that allowed us to be able to do that. But that's the kind of creativity we need when I talk about creating community and sustainable models. We have to begin to understand the dollar that we're getting, whether it's for the federal government, the state dollar, that we have to find a way to make sure that that dollar is working for us. I'll give you another example, then I'll close on this point. We have a lot of tenant base vouchers that have just come into our system. A lot of tenant vouchers, but they can't be converted to uh, project-based vouchers. We don't have a unit for people to go enough units and stuff. So why can't we have flexibility? When we get a resource into our community, if it's a tenant-based voucher, we should have flexibility on how we can use that voucher to create more housing. That's just my opinion. But I just think that we restrict ourselves in, from a government lens that doesn't allow us the flexibility to think outside of the box with plenty of resources and then at the end of the day, we start ending up with all these unused surpluses that, that we have to spend down with these deadlines that make it unreasonable. So once again, system adjustments, looking at how we can meet, not only meet people where they're at, meeting organizations where they're at, <laughs> making sure that we can get the work done. And so those conversations need to occur. I have another question that has come in from Danny Fajardo. Um, he's in Providence and I'm at Providence and I serve as our regional director of corporate and foundation relations for SoCal. Is there an opportunity to ally, align our caregivers with volunteering opportunities to help address homelessness? So how can we align caregivers with volunteering opportunities to help address homelessness? Just a question that has come in. And, 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 and I think you know, although it's specific to, you know, where this person is, but thinking about how can individuals who want to volunteer help in this arena? I know we talked about certain things already, but are there uh, particular needs in general within the community um, to help with supporting this issue? Volunteers or people who want to help? Yeah, absolutely. There are so many opportunities. And I know, research. you know, Oh, yeah. One resource that I um, I often refer folks to is the United Way Everyone In website. They collect a series of volunteer opportunities from all of our nonprofit entities. Um, we have our annual homeless count coming up in January. We need 9,000 volunteers for that. Uh, and you can sign up at LASA.org for our homeless count. Um, and if you have special skills, um, like being a caregiver or social workers, those, those clinical professionals really are a scarcity and we need more, but we also need folks who are willing to support building up our current staff. It takes a lot of people and many organizations to do this work in LA. And so the more that we're able to leverage the talents and expertise of community members to help build that up, the better. Um, so I would say start with everyone in and with your local nonprofits um, and, and figure out how you can get linked up with them. Thank right, you. and I think another opportunity for healthcare works, especially when it comes to the mental health. I think one of the things that we haven't really realized yet from the pandemic is, you know, the post-traumatic stress that's going to come. And I think with the workforces that have maintained the infrastructure like 
places like the Los Angeles Mission, one of the things that we're trying to do is really create opportunities for our staff to deal with the mental health and the anguish that they've had to do. Because, you know, when you have to serve out of pain, you're losing family members, but you're still having to come to work because people that have been disenfranchised need your service. They need you to show up and you're doing that out of pain and loss yourself. A lot of times that trauma is not being addressed. And I think professionals that want to volunteer in organizations should seek an opportunity to come and minister or provide services to the staff that's actually providing the services so that we can work on our mental health, our own mental health and our own emotional stability while we continue to serve. And so I think that that's an opportunity as well when we talk about coming to organizations and volunteering to help maintain the safety net. Yes, that's that's a great point because I know our, you know, similarly, as you indicated that, you know, we, we were open and, you know, operational and our staff were coming in and I was coming in and our teams were coming in to meet the need of all of those at St. Anne's Family Services. And you're right, we're dealing with the impact, you know, or your staff is dealing with the impact of the pandemic as well as making sure that they're here to serve. And so that's a great point, volunteering not only to those individuals, but if there are skill sets that can be utilized for team members. So I want to really, um, you know, thank you for coming and sharing today. I think this conversation was a conversation that was authentic, that was real. There are things that, you know, are working. There are things that we need to change. And we talked about that. Did we solve this issue here today? No. Was that a realistic goal? No, but we made a step. We took some steps in the right direction. We provided some information for those that are in the community who, you know, are just trying to figure out, you know, this seems like there are dollars, but it seems like there's not as much happening. There's also been some explanation of the influx of individuals coming in versus work that's being done. It's just outnumbering. Um, so we need to continue to work. We need to dismantle some of the systems that aren't working. We need support for organizations that are doing the work and making a difference, meeting people where they're at. We need to be honest and truthful about the foundations of some of these inequities and where they started and how they are continued. And we need to really treat people with compassion and humanity. Don't step by and walk by that person. Really see them as an individual. That could be you, know, you tomorrow if certain th situations and things occur. We really have to look at how we can help our fellow um, brother and sister. So. I want to just thank all the panelists for your insights and your time this afternoon. I know you're incredibly busy people. And so I'm very grateful for your conversation and your partnership. I want us to look at in every setting, let's look at successes. When we have those scenarios where we see successful interventions and outcomes, let's see how we can replicate those in, in every scenario. We don't spend enough time. I love when Miguel talked about you know, what was done and how there were folks were followed. Let's look at what works, see how we can replicate that in our community. We're also grateful to our sponsors of today's event, the Charles Dunn Company, Terry Holloman, the Occidental Entertainment Holdings Incorporated. We thank you for helping us put this conversation out to the community in a way that looks to change the narrative. We can only offer these types of programs, our housing, um, and many of you, like I said earlier, know St. Anne's Family Services of working with mothers and young children, but we're providing housing. We're thankful for the opportunity to have this summit and thankful to all our partners. If you would like to support St. Anne's Family Services in any way or any of the friends that you've heard on our um, panel today, please, you know, we want you to click on the link um, that's on the screen and we will take you to where you need to go to be able to thank you for the time today, listening to us, if you wanna share any feedback or you wanna support any of these organizations, we really appreciate it because we've been talking about being in this together since COVID started. Everybody thought it would be a few months and it has turned into a significant amount of time um, but the pandemic has taught us and really shown and highlighted some of the inequities and challenges in our system, but we are going to continue to work to make this uh, resolution to, to try to help end homelessness. We're not giving up on that. What you heard today was hopefulness. We were authentic, but yet still hopeful. 
And so thank you for sharing with us. The multilateral approach is the only way to make this happen. And we have to support each other and not work in silos. So thank you to Miguel, Heidi, Troy. We've got this, right? That's right. We've got this. <laughs> we are not going to be defeated. And I like what was said. Where are our, our children going to live? Where are our families going to live? Don't see folks as those are those folks over there. Those are the others. The others are us. Thank you very much. And let us know anything we can do to help this conversation. And everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you.